nice to see you all here. I'm glad you braved everything to come out and be together tonight in this incredible historic place. Um, I have been here once before, but I have never um, experienced it this way. It's really, really quite charming and amazing. So um, it's interesting, you know, it's always a little embarrassing to be introduced, but I, um, I, I really like the connection with my past on Cape Cod because that's why I'm doing what I'm doing today. Because when I was a kid, I think, you know, at some point in our life, Cape Cod kind of seeps into our, our souls. And um, I was, it happened to me before I was born, really. Um, so I'm, I'm really happy to be here again and to be doing this work. And um, I'm going to talk to you tonight. Well, actually, first I wanted to introduce Sue Sullivan, who's here with me. And Sue is here in the purple dress. She's going to be moving the slides. She is our director of communications and um, communicator extraordinaire. So you'll, you'll hear a little bit more about her work as, as I talk. Um, Feel free, this is a small group, to ask questions if you need something clarified. I think we'll have plenty of time. Um, I feel really uh, lucky to have a whole hour to talk with you. Um, I won't use that whole time with my slides, but, um, but I do have a lot to say. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the history of land conservation, both naturally and on Cape Cod, nationally and on Cape Cod. Um, the work of Barnstable Land Trust, some of our properties, some of our big issues right now, how we do our work, um, how land conservation happens, and how it happens over time. Um, and, uh, and then we'll have time to go into anything that's of particular interest to you. So if we go to the next slide. Um, Many of you know us. I know there's many members in here, and thank you very much. You are what keeps us going. Um, we are a community-supported nonprofit. Our mission is to preserve the natural resources and special places in the town of Barnstable and nearby areas. And our vision is of a Cape that sustains and enhances its natural landscapes, water, and character. And our role in supporting this vision is as a leader in collaborative land conservation. So you'll hear a lot about partnerships tonight. Um, stewardship, community engagement, and advocacy for our natural and cultural resources. And just a few of the values that we really take to heart in our work are stewardship. We carefully manage the resources that are entrusted to us, natural, human, and financial. Um, lasting results. We're committed to ensuring conservation benefits and organizational excellence beyond our lifetimes and place. We put a lot of value on the special places in our community and the importance that place has in our community. So if we go to the next slide, um, it says history of land conservation. I call it a brief and incomplete history of land conservation. Um, but I wanted to tell you a little bit about um, sort of how it all began. And you all probably know about Teddy Roosevelt. Um, land conservation happened at the federal level uh, largely in the early, in the late 1800s, in the 1900s, um, thanks to Teddy Roosevelt. A little bit before then, too, Yosemite and uh, Yellowstone were protected before him. but. Um, for about 75 years after Teddy Roosevelt, um, federal, state, and local governments together did a really great job of, of conservation. And then, um, and including here on the Cape. So we are at nearly at the 61st anniversary of protecting um, one of the most important conservation places on the Cape, which is National Seashore, right. So August 1961, President Kennedy signed the bill authorizing the establishment of the Cape Cod National Seashore. And um, 
He, the goal he wrote was to preserve the natural and historic values of a portion of Cape Cod for the ins inspiration and enjoyment of people all over the United States. And one of the really interesting things that Sue found about um, the process leading up to the, the conservation of this enormous land was it was, it was a battle. Um, it was a battle then just like it can be a battle now. So, and it was also the first time that the federal government had created a national park out of land that was primarily in private hands. So there were months of hearings and meetings required to produce a bill that balanced public and private interest. And um, they, what are my notes saying here? Um, the conflicts then were, as I said, much as they are now. And what was happening at the time was um, the fishing industry had really declined. There was really a, a very steady growth of tourism um, and, and quite a rapid pace of development that seemed like and felt like it was threatening the very things that residents and visitors alike found so appealing about Cape Cod. And one resident was quoted as saying, the resources which were once believed to be inexhaustible are vanishing before our eyes. Another resident said, I think the time has passed, this is 1960, remember, I think the time has passed when we old timers can hope that Cape Cod will stay the way it is. We have absolute proof that it is going to change. And then the issue is, should it be done by bulldozers, by money mad people, by banks wanting to lend, by builders wanting quick jobs, by loan sharks, or is it to be done by the US government in another manner? And if it sounds familiar, it is you know, the same story as we experience and have experienced um, since then. So today, the seashore encompasses more than 43,000 acres and draws more than 4 million visitors a year. And this was the beginning of the end of federal activity in land conservation, which got picked up by local land trusts and sometimes um, larger regional and national land trusts. Um, so by 1980, there were more than 400 local land trusts, mostly in the Northeast and mostly volunteer. And the majority of land was protected by fee ownership, meaning the land trusts owned the land that was donated or they bought, rather than conservation easements or conservation restrictions. So let me just pause a minute and, and explain those terms. If people, anyone doesn't know what a conservation restriction is, it is um, a restriction on the land that's similar to a deed restriction, but it uh, basically removes all of the development potential on the land with certain exceptions. It can be written in a, in a flexible way, but most what it means most of the time is the land cannot be developed ever. So it's protected in perpetuity and is a really, really strong tool just like conserving land um, uh, through fee ownership. So um, today, most states have at least one land trust. Massachusetts has 160 plus land trusts. Um, and land trusts together have protected over 12 million acres across the country. Actually, more than that, because that was, that was a, that's a, an old number, at least 15 years old. So how do we pay for all this land? Um, in Massachusetts, we are really lucky, because not only have we had an important resource for funding land conservation for many years, but we also have other kinds of incentives, and I'll talk about them. But in 1998, um, the land bank became available, and all 15 towns, um, each of 15 towns, that's not every town on Cape Cod, but each of the 15 towns voted to approve a 3% surcharge on property taxes to fund acquisition of open space. And this is something that's really interesting about land conservation and that I am particularly grateful for because it is one of the very few things that people are willing to raise their taxes to pay for and they have done it over and over again. 
Um, so the land bank program was a very bold experience to buy land and save it from development. Um, through it on Cape Cod, Cape Cod Towns purchased 4,500 acres through the beginning of 2007 when it was converted into the Community Preservation Act, which we still have today, and which is a really, really important tool for towns and for nonprofit organizations trying to save land. Um, and um, something interesting about um, Massachusetts in particular is that the, the whole um, heart of conservation conservation organizations, and a number of conservation practices began here. Um, in um, 1896, two women, Harriet Hemingway and Minna Hall, founded the Massachusetts Audubon Society, which was the first Audubon Society in the country. Um, the Appalachian Mountain Club was founded in 1876 in Boston, which was the first permanent organization of hikers and mountaineers in the US. And the first land trust was the Trustees of Reservation, which was founded largely through the work of Charles Eliot. And some other famous Massachusetts people who you might not know about, Benton Mackay, who founded and was to a large extent responsible for the Appalachian Trail. Frederick Law Olmsted, who we know has designed parks in Boston and New York and Philadelphia, um, and I believe Osterville, not to mention Thoreau and Emerson. So we have a really long, wonderful history here of leadership. And on the Cape, too, we have our own special system. Um, we have a, an organization called the Compact of Cape Cod Conservation Trusts, led by Mark Robinson, who some of you may know, um, that provides technical services for all of the land trusts on Cape Cod. It's been around for 30 years, um, and I talk to Mark nearly every day. It's a very, very important organization. So let's go to the next slide and get a little visual on why this is all relevant and important. So we're going to go through these pretty quickly, but what these maps show, they were produced by the Cape Cod Commission, is how land has been developed or protected over the last 100 plus years. So Sue, you can go through, just, yep, keep going. So here we are in 2017, and it's, um, the, the very dark areas and the very light areas are mostly protected. Um, this is on the Cape Cod Commission website if, if anyone wants to, to look it up. And that big, big light colored area um, on the upper cape there is the, is the base. Um, but what this says is that there's not much land, only 14% of land that's not spoken for on Cape Cod. And if we go to the next slide, we'll, I'll sort of zoom in so you can see what the town of Barnstable looks like. Um, I think this is 2021. So what this is showing you, the green areas are all protected conservation land. The brown areas are all development, residential or commercial. And the white areas are, um, are open. Now some of them are water district land. <laughs> So um, they sort of fall in this gray area between protected and unprotected, but some of them are, are golf courses. Some of them are cranberry bogs. Um, but we have in Barnstable probably somewhere between 15 and 20% of the land still up for grabs. And um, we've protected about 27%. So we've done a good job. Um, that's a good, you know, I think President Biden's um, goal is 30 by 30, 30% 30 of land protected by 2030. Um, the Cape is actually already there. A lot of Massachusetts is already there. That is not to say we have no more work to do. So let's go there. If we go to the next slide. Um, 
talk a little bit about why open land is, is important. And I, I'll go through this pretty quickly because I'm sure you're all really familiar with why it's important for environmental reasons. You know, land, forested land, open space, that's what filters our drinking water, which is from a sole source aquifer, as we all know, underneath the ground. So anything that um, runs off pavement rather than getting filtered through water um, does not benefit from um, the nutrient removal and the removal of, of all of the kinds of things that you don't want to drink in your water. So open land is really good for that. It's really good for flood pre prevention. Anytime we don't pave something over, we make it easier for the ground to absorb excess water. Um, obviously a really important for habitat for wildlife. We're starting to see coyotes now in downtown Hyannis. So, you know, we're, we're seeing what happens when we, when we take away their habitat. Carbon sequestration is really important for um, climate change mitigation and adaptation. And what sequestration is, is basically storage. So what we're learning now is that it's not only forest land and, and fields that store carbon, but wetlands and marshes are even more efficient as, at storing carbon. So as sea level rises, we're risking losing those incredibly important resources as well. Um, I think we all knew, we all learned, um, if we didn't know it before during the pandemic, that getting outside is really important for our, for our mental health. And um, we're seeing more and more people on our lands than ever before. Um, and we're really glad. Um, that's one of the reasons we produce these maps is that sometimes we have new hikers and people coming outside visiting these places for the first time, which is fantastic. But they need to know um, what, not only where to go, but what poison ivy looks like and what to do about ticks and things like that. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about fishing and shell fishing and, uh, in a minute. But, you know, the same thing that I, I quoted, the quote I read you about the National Seashore, about, you know, why people come here. Um, our economy is based on people coming here for the natural beauty. And when we lose that, we lose a really, really important basis for our whole economy. I'll talk a little bit about property values as well in a minute, but just, you know, Generally, we're, we're all here and we stay here because we love it, because it is a special place, because of the natural environment. And if that changes, we're all going to be less likely to want to stay. So if you go to the next slide, I'll just go into these a little bit. It's just um, a, a much more significant part of our economy that I, than I think some folks realize. Um, Fishing is hugely important in Massachusetts especially. Um, more, it's a bigger industry in Massachusetts than it is in any other part of New England. Lots and lots of jobs um, rely on it. Lots and lots of um, income and, and uh, tax impacts. If you go to the next slide. Um, this is an issue that... Um, often is misunderstood, I think. When, when I do presentations or when I go to ask the town council um, to approve a conservation restriction um, or to help buy a really important parcel, I often hear, you're going to take it off the tax rolls, it's going to cost everybody money. And in fact, what often happens is it's a net benefit. Um, and the reason it's often a net benefit is that there are very much fewer costs of services for open space than there are for developed land. Um, there are not, there are no costs for, um, for police, fire generally, um, schools, um, and uh, sewer, um, sewer and water. So. There's all these avoided costs when you have open space and um, all of these benefits that I just talked about, mitigating climate change, um, 
helping with drinking water quality. The town of Barnstable is about to spend a billion dollars on sewers. Um, <clears throat> thinking about land as a resource, as a natural system for helping us solve some of these issues is really, really important, rather than thinking about it as a resource that should be taxed. Um, let's see. I, just, I also have just a few other numbers about um, how much income and revenue outdoor recreation generates in Massachusetts. Um, these are pretty recent numbers. Out, outdoor recreation in Massachusetts generates 90,000 jobs, three and a half billion dollars in wages and salaries. Um, and yeah, I think I'll leave it there. So I guess my, my point here is that it's not just a tree hugger issue. Um, it is, it's an important economic issue and we should understand the details around that. So if we go to the next slide, um, a little bit about our organization. We've been around since 1983. Um, that was the beginning of uh, real pressures on land. Um, as soon as uh, Route 6 was finished, the development really started coming in. And um, with the end of a lot of federal focus on land conservation, uh, land trusts had to step up. That happened in um, in the early 80s here and in, in most of the other places on the Cape. So BLT hired its first staff person, Jackie Barton, who many of you probably know, in 1985. She worked out of her home office for $5 an hour and stayed for 30 plus years um, building the organization, um, protecting over 1,100 acres of land helping the town protect another 11,000 acres of land. Um, and one interesting partnership that Jackie was part of, which I, I wanted to mention because it's relevant today, was that when the land bank money ran out and the Community Preservation Act money was available in 2007, um, there was a big advocacy effort to get the town to support the Community Preservation Act, because again, that was a vote to um, take 3%, add 3% to your property taxes to, to pay for this fund. So there was the option at that point to expand it from land to land and housing and historic preservation. And um, Jackie and company worked with the Housing Assistance Corporation to get this uh, passed in Barnstable. Um, and it was a really important partnership to provide, um, to provide funding for two really, really, three really, really important needs on the Cape um, and working together. Now we find ourselves in a situation where um, housing and open space are being placed at odds and um, and it's really unfortunate, and I'll talk about that a, a little bit more. Um, wishing we can go back to the days when, when we realized that um, there was that that it's not a zero sum game. So, um, in 2011, we merged with the Mary Barton Land Trust, which had over 150 acres in Katuit. And that's one of our biggest and most important sanctuaries now, Eagle Pond and Little River. Um, and following that, um, we bought our first office in 2017. So before that, we were in Hyannis. And um, if you haven't seen our office on 6A, just down the road, I encourage you to come by and, and visit us. We've got a beautiful trail in the back, a boardwalk, viewing platform, incredible number of herons and egrets roost there. Um, I saw this afternoon a, a black crown night heron there and a bunch of great, great whites. Um, so even now, it's really beautiful. And in, um, in the fall, it's incredible. Um, and we also have a conference room. So that's for um, 
are used for meetings and also for community use. So if we go to the next slide, um, like any organization, we are constantly adapting to a changing environment. And the, the, the issues that are facing us now, um, some are old and some are new. So we are dealing with protecting water quality and wetlands. And, um, you know, I think the, the water quality problem is much more visible. Is anyone on, from the south side here? from Ketuit or Osterville or... So when I go there, I see that the water's browner and you know you can just see the, the nutrification happening down there. And it's really terrible. Um, and you can see it in all of the ponds too and the issues with cyanobacteria. All of those things are new and all of those things are issues that um, are absolutely related to development. They're related to septics. They're related to what we put on our lawns. Um, and uh, they're related, you know, the, the more we develop, the worse it's going to be. Um, we also, I mentioned the, the partnership with the Housing Assistance Corporation. <clears throat> We're also um, experiencing this uh, sort of conversation, public conversation about housing um, and open space in a, in a very sort of, uh, con um, it's, it's sort of being uh, posed as, as a conflict. And the way we've engaged in this um, is through the Twin Brooks Golf Course Project. Anybody hear about that? So um, this, there's a proposed development uh, 312 units on the Twin Brooks Golf Course, which is at the West End Rotary, um, right behind the um, Resort and Conference Center. It's one of the largest remaining open spaces in Hyannis, which is very underserved for open space. When we heard about the proposed development, um, we did a few things. We said, first of all, to the owner, if this development falls through, we're interested in helping conserve this property. And we said, um, we understand that there is a huge need for housing on the Cape. We experience it ourselves with our own staff. Um, and we don't want to be in a position of saying there shouldn't be any housing on this site. So we hired a um, planning and design firm to help us imagine how you could put both uh, open space and, and housing on that site. And we had many, many meetings with the community. We had a survey. We tried to get as much input as we could so that this wouldn't just be our idea or our consultant's idea, but what people wanted from the community. And we put together um, a couple of different plans that showed how you could put, using much less of the golf course for housing, but how you could put up to 250 units of housing on this site. And, um, and as, a, um, as a result of that, we have been engaged in the whole regulatory process around this project. Um, and I'm happy to go into that more after I finish my conversation. But, it has been, um, it's been portrayed, I think, by some members of the housing community, not all of them, but by some of them as, you know, we're a NIMBY organization, we don't believe in housing. Um, and what we were really trying to do was find a middle ground um, because we feel like both issues are so, so important to our community and we can't invest in one at the, to the detriment of the other. Um, so um, another issue that this project raised for us was there are all these lands that fall somewhere between pristine open space and fully developed land. So cranberry bogs, farms, camps, golf courses. They're somewhat developed, they're somewhat disturbed, but they're still open space and the community to the community they're still really important. Um, they think of, for people who walk their dogs around bogs, right? 
They are so, so important to the neighborhood, but they're not protected and they're privately owned. So this is a whole category of land that um, needs attention by, we think, by the Cape Cod Commission so that you can't just develop it like you would a parking lot. It, it's not paved over, it's, you know, it's not developed in the same way. There can be an upland bog, um, often they're wetland, but that's not always the case in Marston's Mills and, and West Barnstable. Um, <clears throat> and then finally, climate change is um, the other thing that we're really trying to grapple with because um, it, it's here, it's happening, it's so um, such a diffuse um, set of circumstances that it's really hard to figure out what to do, but land trusts are trying to um, get our arms around what we can do as conservation organizations to deal with that. Um, now I'm going to talk about a few specific local examples of, of how we've protected land. Um, very recently we protected two um, parcels in West Barnstable, very near to here. Just a year and a half ago, uh, the town bought this 16-acre property on Falcon Road, um, which is has beautiful trails through it, an old cranberry bog. It's off um, Plum Street. And um, we worked with the town to do that. And this is often how we work, is that we will, uh, an owner will come to us and say, I'm interested in conserving my land. And we'll put together an agreement with them. And then we'll go to the town and say, is this something you would like to own? Um, or, you know, do you, do you want to hold a conservation restriction on it, or do you want nothing? So in this case, the town wanted to own it, and um, we are holding the conservation restriction on it. The, the picture in the middle there is um, very important to this organization. It's the Shaw's Lane property, which we purchased from the 1717 Meeting House Foundation in, I think it was 2018. And one of the most important aspects of this parcel, which is right across from the Jenkins um, Wildlife Sanctuary on Church Street, um, is that it's part of the Cape Cod Pathways system. So the Cape Cod Pathways is the trail that runs um, all the way from the sandwich line in the West Barnesville Conservation Area all the way to um, the Yarmouth line. And so allowing this property to, de to get developed would have really interrupted that trail. So we're very grateful um, that that project worked out. Uh, that was done with the support of the town, but in that case, Barnesville Land Trust owns the property and the town holds the conservation restriction. <clears throat> and then this um, picture over here is... Um, Bayview Farm, which was an enormous several hundred acre um, decade long prog proper, um, project that took um, federal participation, state participation, local town participation, the Nature Conservancy, um, I believe Arenda, um, <clears throat> possibly other land trusts but many years and a lot of money to protect um, a really huge and one of the most important um, highest value conservation areas on, the, um, on this side of the Cape, which is the Great Marsh. So those are a couple of examples of different kinds of projects that have been done recently. Um, the next slide is about land stewardship because um, land conservation is not just a transaction, it's a long-term relationship. And <clears throat> when we own a piece of land, we commit to taking care of it forever. So um, 
what that means often is um, removing invasives, sometimes mowing, picking up trash, picking up all kinds of things that people feel they are allowed to dump um, on our property. It's quite amazing what, um, what we found. Um, in the case of Bansfield Meadow, which is in Osterville, on East Bay Road, we worked with neighbors to um, dredge uh, and put a, uh, enlarge a culvert in a tidal pond um, over the last three or four years. Um, luckily, the neighbors were very, very generous and um, paid for most of it. But this is a pond, this was a project that had been on the town in the town budget for decades, it never made it to the top of the list. And so finally, um, the neighbors and we were able to make it happen. And the pond is actually coming back to life. It was about two or three inches deep um, two years ago. And now there is tidal flow again. And hopefully, we'll see some shellfish coming back. And, and also did an enormous um, invasive plant removal project there and we planted um, natives all around it. So um, it's worth a visit. So um, how do we do this work? We do it with um, one staff person, two uh, AmeriCorps service members, and about 30 to 40 very regular volunteers who work with us weekly. They, we have a mowing team. Um, we have a team that loves to use their um, chainsaws. Um, we have weeders. We have a really, really fantastic and committed group of people, and this would never, um, would never work without them. Um, and I should say, we have, we have volunteers that do other things, too. And you know we're not an all-volunteer organization anymore, but um, volunteers uh, allow us to, to function and to sort of stay committed to, to our mission. So the next slide shows a project that we're working on right now. Um, many of you probably have driven by Fuller Farm on 149 um, many times. We purchased that from the Fuller family in 2012. It's a 22-acre farm and woodland. One of the few remaining um, places with a really large field of uh, little blue stem. And um, Barbara Fuller, who sold the property to us, did not want to see this property developed. She could have sold it to be a really large subdivision. But she didn't want it to be developed. She, she told Jackie that um, people don't know where their food comes from anymore. And um, that really made her sad. And she was really happy when the land trust was able to take it. And now we are really trying to implement our vision for the property, which is to bring back the agricultural history. So we have a few partnerships that we've already started. One is with a local group um, run by Christy Cap, who lives down the road here, um, and runs Resilient Roots, which is an organization that um, teaches how to do permaculture gardening. Um, and she has almost an acre on the property that she is planting. Um, then we have a partnership with a goat business, Goat Green Cape Cod, who is keeping her goats on the property when they're not out working. And um, we are keeping one field that will be a pollinator field um, that will require a lot of invasives removal and uh, replanting. But that's really important. And then we're building a barn. And the barn is going to house our stewardship equipment, which, as you can imagine, we take care of 17, 750 acres of land. Um, we need some equipment. And right now, it's living in a tiny little shed behind our office. So um, we'll be able to keep it and maintain it in the bottom part of the barn, which will be built into the hill. And then the top part will be workshop and um, 
education space. And um, it's going to be a post and bean barn. You'll see it going up this summer. Um, supply chain and all of those things uh, cooperating. But they have started digging the foundation, and, and so it is going to happen. It's very, very exciting. So if we go to the next slide, um, another project that we're working on right now is the protection of the last five acres of the, the old Brazelton farm on Commerce Road in Barnstable. It's an incredibly beautiful hillside. It's on an incredibly popular walking trail up Mill Way and around Commerce Road back to 6A. Um, with a view to uh, Barnstable Harbor and Sandy Neck. And we've made an agreement with the owners to purchase one of the lots, and then they will donate to conservation restrictions on the other two lots. So the light green area and the dark green area are already all conserved. Um, the sort of um, rectangular piece in the middle there will be conserved. and. Um, that's really the last piece of this property. We've been working on this with the family since 1994. And um, that's the way it goes sometimes. It's, it's a, a family that's committed to keeping a landscape um, the, way they, the way it is, the way they treasure it, and, um, and we can help with that. Um, this project is benefiting from a tool that's really important in Massachusetts called the Massachusetts Conservation Land Tax Credit, which gives um, an owner a, a tax credit, actual check. It's not a deduction, it's a check. Um, if they uh, sell at below market value. So they have to prove that, but we, this is a tool that we've used over and over again, and it's really, really helpful because it means that you don't have to um, give away the store when you sell land for conservation. Um, and and uh, that really it shouldn't be, shouldn't have to give up a lot to, to conserve your land. So tools like that really help. Um, so this project is underway. We want to close in early 2023. We're in the campaign phase of that right now. We've raised about uh, 350 of the $550,000 for the project, so we have about 200,000 left to raise, and hopefully we'll do that this summer. You know, one thing I didn't mention um, is that Sometimes properties like this, I, I don't think this one is still in Chapter 61, but um, Chapter 61 is part of the tax code which allows land that is being farmed or forest, uh, forested, used, used for, for um, forestry purposes or stables to pay a much lower tax rate. And when a, a property like that comes up for sale, which there's quite a few now that are coming up for sale because of the demand um, and the incredible pressure on the land and the uh, land prices. The town has a right of first refusal if there's an offer made on that property. And so it's an opportunity for us that we need to be prepared for now especially. Um, for example, the stables, um, on, yeah, right down the road here um, are for sale. And there's an 18-acre piece of that that abuts the Bridge Creek Conservation Area. So um, if there is an offer made and the owner wants to accept it, they have to offer it to the town for that same price. The town can't pay a different price. They have to pay what what's offered. Um, and uh, but that's an opportunity for us to protect some of these really important places that are now open. So next slide. In addition to these projects uh, that we have underway, we are um, getting donated a project from the Sylvia family, which is a 20-acre, mostly swamp, um, in Centerville. But it has a beautiful boardwalk that leads to this wonderful um, little beech leaf island. Um, it's on Beech Leaf Island Road. And it's 
right across the road from a big town property that's right behind the Centerville Elementary School. So we um, are hoping that we will be able to rebuild the trail that once was through the town property to the school. It used to be an outdoor education um, area and the kids used to walk the trail. Um, so hopefully when uh, this happens, we'll be able to rebuild that trail so that the kids can walk down through the town property and then through this lovely boardwalk to this incredibly cool um, beach leaf island area and um, get into nature, get some environmental education. Um, we have a, a few projects with the town that we are uh, working on conservation restrictions on. And we also have, um, uh, uh, we've prepared a map that prioritizes land um, that's not yet been developed or is, um, falls into one of these categories, farmland, recreation land. Um, we've prioritized it for conservation. So we have a map with different layers showing conservation values and um, slowly working on trying to um, acquire or conserve through restriction um, those properties while we can. Right now there is again so much pressure on people to to sell that um, it's the urgency is is incredible um, and the good news is that there's a lot of money out there now at the state and federal level um, but it's um, you need capacity at the organization level to be able to access it. So that's one of the, that's one of the barriers to us right now. So coming to a close slowly here, we are um, maybe one of the most uh, practical things that we did recently, thanks to a very generous donor whose idea it was, um, to help people get outside, we've produced a, a few maps for the town. The Barnstable Trail Guide was the first um, comprehensive uh, trail guide in the town. It includes town properties, it includes our properties, Mass Audubon, um, 34 trail locations, almost 95 hiking miles on it. Um, and those are in the back if, you're, if you haven't seen it yet and you're interested. Um, we just finished the Cape Cod Pathways um, trail map, which is really exciting because this is a trail that a lot of people don't know about. Um, it's been a well-kept secret for a long time, and there's some of the most beautiful trails um, with a lot of really interesting sort of indigenous culture and history. And then um, coming soon is our Eagle Pond and Little River Sanctuary trail map, um, which is the 150 acre uh, property in Katuit, really beautiful trails and um, a lot of history in that, in that map as well. So if you haven't been there, um, that too is worth a visit. So um, we have a lot of programming that we're doing now, thanks to Sue. Um, we've always done walks and talks, but now we're doing a lot of interesting new par partnerships um, uh, one of my favorites is our Words in the Wild project, which was the brainchild of Sue and um, Lauren Wolk, who was until recently at the Yarmouth Cultural Center and is a local author, um, and Bob Nash. And um, they worked with four poets, four local poets, to write poems at four different locations on our properties. Um, I think there's, let's see, one at Fuller Farm, two at Eagle Pond, no, two, one at Eagle Pond, one at Ropes Field in Katuit, and um, the other behind our office. And the, the Bob Nash and the Cape Cod Makers Group used this really cool technology called Glowforge technology to etch the poems on these beautiful cedar planks, which are now um, at all of these properties, and it's just a wonderful different way of experiencing them. Um, we've collaborated with the Cahoon, with the Katuit Center for the Arts and their art bus. 
Um, we've done a Cape-wide um, collaboration, first day hikes in January, and coming up the, the summer solstice hikes, which give people an opportunity to hike different parts of the Cape that they maybe haven't been to before. Um, and a really fun um, upcoming program, which is the Flower Pot Music Concert with the Cape Symphony. Um, so if you want to learn more about that, I'm just going to tease you with that information. And you, you have to go look it up on our website. Um, and then upcoming programs. Tomorrow, actually, we have a Lady Slipper Hunt and Hike at Crocker Neck in Ketuit. Our Tour to Barnstable Charity Ride um, is Sunday, uh, starting at Azelton Park in Hyannis. Um, celebrate the solstice. This is our Cape Wide um, Walks. That's June 18th through the 21st. And if you are interested or you know anyone is, who's interested in um, uh, conserving, finding out about conserving their land, we're going to have a land conservation workshop at our office on July uh, or June 22nd. And our annual meeting for members is going to be at the Osterville Village Library on July 12th. At the, Aust um, yeah, at the Osterville Village Library. Conservation workshop is at our office. Um, other ways to get involved, um, if you go to the next one, yep. Uh, many of you are members, but if you're not, it costs $25 to be a member. Um, you can find out about conserving your land. You can volunteer in many different ways, come to a program, Sign up for our e-news and learn about what's up. Um, explore a trail. Tell people about us. All of those things are really, really helpful. And you can find out about us on our website, which is blt.org, um, or pick up um, a brochure and the materials on your way out. And that is all I have. Yeah, how did I do?